We're going to recognize some very special people at this time. They are making their way to the stage even as I speak. Let's give a big round of applause for our rising middle schoolers and our rising ninth graders. How about these guys as they come? Look at them coming up here. They look so excited. <laughs> They're so happy to be here. Come on down, guys. All the way down. Keep going. Keep going. There we go. Come on down to me. Excellent. 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 Get right here. Perfect. Perfect. It's a little bit intimidating coming up on this stage, right? Got all the bright lights. Come right on down, all the way down here. Come on, sweetie. There you go. Slide on in. Okay. Well, I asked. Uh, Mr. Kevin to help me with this um, because he has he has taught these young people for a long time a lot of these kids that are standing on the stage they've gone through bridge kids with him he's one of our bridge kids lead teachers Kevin Caps is and uh, he's taught these these young people a long time so we want to recognize them right now for their accomplishments as they uh as they are graduating, we're going to begin with our rising sixth graders. So they're going to middle school. So, Kevin, who do we have on stage here today? All right. So we have, uh, it's an incredible group here that I've been able to uh, teach since they were in the second or third grade. And now they were in my, in my fifth grade class and now they're moving up. And I'm super proud of them. And um, I'm going to call your name out and let's just uh, really make them feel good. All right. Ramaya Wooten. Reagan, uh, Reagan Whitfield. Whitfield. <laughs> Brooklyn Voyez. <laughs> Easter, Easton Lily. Easter, yeah, sorry. East. <clears throat> you see why I don't need a mic anywhere near me? Ricky Harris. Caden Flores. <clears throat> Nalani Deal. <laughs> Jordan Wall. <clears throat> Trenton Offenberg. <clears throat> and Ava Thompson. That is our fifth graders going into the sixth grade. How about our, how about our uh, rising ninth graders? Yep. <laughs> Who do we have, Kevin? Oh, okay. Yeah. We got them here on the stage here. Everybody look at them. <laughs> everybody check them out. <laughs> I bet we have Michaela Lilly. We do. Yeah. <laughs> we also have uh, Dante Lyon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, 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 I got this one. Connor Rose. <laughs> well, guys, we know that this doesn't happen by accident. This doesn't happen by chance. It takes moms and dads being a part of their lives and, and investing in them. So I want all the parents of these young people yeah. to stand right where you are right now. Stand right up. Mom, dad, guardians, caregivers, stand up. Let's give them a big round of applause here today. Yeah. Thank you so much for all that you invest. Now, guys, I want to share something with you this morning. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 6, tells us to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge Him and He will direct our path. As you begin this new journey, this new chapter in your, your life, your educational journey, but also your maturation, our prayer is that you will do that every step of the way that you will trust God with your life, 
and allow him to lead you in everything you do in everything you are and everything he plans for you and desires for you to become so we're going to pray for you right now would you bow your hands with me guys if you're comfortable with it would you just lift your hands toward the stage and let's pray over our rising middle schoolers and high school freshmen god right now we lift up these young people to you tonight or this morning we ask you god to to be with them lord thank you for how you have worked in their lives thus far thank you for what you've done to encourage them and to to keep them lord on this path that you've called them to this journey with jesus that god as they enter into a, a whole new chapter of their life with new pressures and new stressors god that they would constantly look to you understanding that nothing else matters if they don't please you. So help them honor you, God, with their lives, with the choices that they make, the decisions. There are so many that are out there for them, that are waiting for them. We know they're gonna choose well. We ask your richest blessings on their life as they lean not on their understanding, but on the understanding of Christ. Lord, we, we love them. We're thankful for them, and we honor them today for all that they've accomplished. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. One more time. Can you give them a big round of applause? Good job. My name is Carly and I'm a graduate from Rosewood High School. My name is Colin and I'm a 2022 graduate from Rosewood High School. Hi, my name is Danielle and I am a graduate of Wayne Early Middle College High School. Hey, my name is Danielle Moore and I'm graduating from Wayne School of Engineering. My name is Taylor and I'm graduating from Rosewood High School. If I had to describe my senior year in three words, it would probably be fortunate, memorable, and challenging. Challenging. Challenging challenging college apps are hard but overall unique eye-opening and gratifying when looking back on my senior year um, I'll probably remember working with and meeting so many amazing people through cheerleading um, I'm very proud of like the accomplishments I've made but I think more importantly just the mundane moments with friends is what I remember the most hanging out after school and different sports events and just the um, special time with friends I've looked up to my parents because no matter the different obstacles that hit them in life, they show me like you can get out of it no matter, just keep pushing. I've looked up to my mom because she's not given enough credit for all the things she's been through and yet she keeps a kind heart and still manages to serve others. Um, definitely my parents, most importantly. They've always pushed me to be the best version of myself and I, um, I really admire who they are as people and who they are in their career and as parents. The advice I would have for an incoming freshman is just focus on your grades. Make school a priority. Always give your best effort in your classes and towards your grades. That's one thing that you'll never regret. Just take it slow and take it easy and take your time. Try out for the team or talk to the new girl because you don't get these moments back. Just have fun, make memories and mistakes, but learn from them. Just be yourself. It's, it's so easy to get caught up in what other people want you to be, and it's hard. And it just makes life so much easier when you're yourself and don't worry about what other people think. The message I'd love to give my family is just thank you. Thank you for always supporting me, always pushing me to be my best. I didn't have to be the best, but you always wanted me to be my best, and that's a lesson I'll take with me whenever I have kids. Um, and just thank you for all the sacrifices you made and for always showing up and being present. Thank you for pushing me when I felt like I didn't have the strength to keep going and show me that I could do it. I did it! After all of this hard work, we finally did it. Um, Mom, thanks for supporting me and allowing me to make my own decisions. Thanks for believing in me and pushing me to do my best and become who I am today and sitting with me through my Calc 1 tears and <laughs> my Fire Princess accomplishments and the cheer titles. Um, but I can't stress this enough. I love you. That's awesome.
Amen. Are you ready to meet these graduates in person? Yeah, let's begin right down here at the very end. Danielle Combe graduating from Wayne Early Middle. Would you step forward? Just take a step forward. And as you're, as you're forward, stay right there. I want her family to stand. We want to recognize you as well and all that you poured into, into her life. Amen. Thank you. Next, we have Cullen Daniels. Cullen, yeah, he is graduating from Rosewood. You got any family here, Cullen? Anybody here with you today? All right, look at there. I like Cullen because he says, just take it slow and easy, baby. <laughs> you can step back, buddy. I'm 52, my voice ain't that deep yet. <laughs> Miss Carly Denning graduating from Rosewood. Would her family please stand? Yeah, look at there. Excellent. Thank you, Carly. Miss Taylor Gary graduating from Rosewood. Her family. Is any fan? There they are, right over there. Hey, Mom. God bless you. Take a step back. And then we have Miss Danielle Moore graduating from Wayne School of Engineering. Stand up, parents. Yeah, there we go. And grandparents. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. I think I know this guy pretty well. Mr. Hunter Stovall graduating from Wayne Christian. Stand up, mama. Mimi, any other family? I'm already standing. <laughs> Proud of you, son. God bless you. And he could not be here today, but Mr. Caleb Hayes, graduating from Rosewood High School. Let's hear it for Caleb, one of our high school graduates. We're incredibly proud of you guys. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart is working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I loved what you guys said up on that, uh, on the big screen when you were doing your video, talking about grades. Were all of you parents so happy they were talking about grades? Remind them six months from now they were talking about grades and uh, doing well in school and all that focusing. I know you will. But remember, too, that everything you do, everywhere you go, you take Jesus with you, okay? You're an ambassador of Christ. So remember that. With every opportunity, every door that God opens for you, remember that you are honoring him. Your number one chief desire as a believer should be to, to do everything you do as unto the Lord a wise man told me one time, he said, I don't care what God calls you to do. If it's digging a ditch, if it's standing on a stage, if it's working in, the, in politics, whatever it is you're called to do, you do it under the Lord. And you do it the best that you can do it. I love it, Taylor, what you said. Not being better than everybody else, but being your best. That's our prayer for each and every one of you. Let's pray over these graduates. Would you stretch your hand forward as we do so? Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to, to love on these graduates for just a moment, to pause and thank you, God, for these accomplishments that they've made. God, we're so proud of them, and we pray your richest blessings on their lives as they endeavor to, to step out into this world and change it, God, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the work that they're going to do for the kingdom in every realm of, of, of whatever field they serve in. God, I just ask you to bless their families as they continue to walk with them on this journey. We're so proud of the young men and women that they are and for the world they're going to change. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said together, amen, amen. Let's hear it one more time. That way, guys. Amen. Is that awesome or what? Is that cool stuff? 
Can I take one more minute? Is it all right if we take one more minute? I'm going to preach as long as I want, but I mean, one more minute. Can we recognize the bridge kids and bridge students, volunteers that have poured into their lives? If, if you fought in that category, would you stand? Can we just honor you guys? Come on, don't be shy. A lot of them are serving right now in those various areas, but we appreciate you so much. We're here to partner with these parents. We're here to come alongside and, uh, and help them in any way that we can as they uh, train their children in the way of the Lord. And we're excited to be a part of all of that. God bless you guys. So good to see you today. We're wrapping up a series though. And I really wanted to wrap up this message on this Sunday because, uh, because our graduates are here and so many of our students are in the room. This is a really critical message for all of us, but it's also a real critical message for our students as they go into the next season of life and particularly for our high school seniors as they go away to college or military or career or whatever it is that they're going to be doing next in their season. So Luke chapter 11 is our key passage. We've been looking at it throughout the series. We wrap it up today with one more read. Here we go. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. They wanted the same kind of power. They wanted the same kind of strength. They wanted the stuff that they saw, saw taking place in Jesus' life, and they knew that Jesus was in constant prayer contact with the Heavenly Father. So, so Lord, would you teach us to pray, not just because we can have, we want the mechanics of prayer, how to say these things, but we want to have the same power. We want to say, have the same access to the Father that you do. So if you've missed it, if you're new, then go online, get the messages, dig into this stuff, because I really believe it's critical to all of our lives. We've talked about why we pray. We've talked about the conditions, our part of getting answers to prayer. We've talked about how to pray, the mechanics of prayer. Last week, we talked about what do you do when you have doubts and how can you pray effectively even when you have human doubts, which should rally for all of us. But today, I want to wrap it up with this simple question and response. How many of you, you don't have to respond, you can sit still, but how many of you ever have prayed sincerely, passionately, ask God for direction or answers, and heaven was silent as midnight. It's like, I, 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 God, could you send me a text? I mean, you know, shoot an airplane across the sky with a ticker tape behind it. I mean, I just I need to hear from you, God. I need a response to this question that I'm bringing. Can I tell you something that's worse than that? And that is, and I've seen this over the years and I've seen it in my own life, is that when I think I've got an idea, I think I've got an impression that I think might be from God, but I don't know for sure if it's him or not. You ever had an idea that you thought was from God and then later found out that you ate too much pizza that night? That's the only reason you got that impression? I mean, the reality is that we need a way not just to hear from him, but we need a way to know if these ideas, these impressions, these thoughts that we have actually come from God. And that's, so that's what I want to invest a few minutes in this morning. We'll do it as quickly as we can, but I want to make sure you have a tool uh, that's available to you that you can use to help you figure that out. The fact is, God is still speaking. Somebody say it with me. God is still speaking. Job 33, verse 14, for God does speak now one way, now another, though a man may not perceive it. In other words, God is speaking right now in this room, just like there are Wi-Fi signals in this room. The only, the only question is whether you're tuned in, whether you're picking up. The problem is that some of the ideas that we get are not from God, they're from ourselves. We get an idea, you know, the fact is, I can get an idea and, and camp out on that idea for a while, and after a while, I get so excited, I start thinking, that must be God. <laughs> you know, I'm really pumped about that thing, but there's a problem. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way that, what's the word? Seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. So sometimes I start thinking, this must be God, but what if I'm wrong? And of course, the, the scariest part is that some ideas don't come from God. They don't come from yourself. In fact, they come from the enemy of your soul, the accuser of the brethren. They come from Satan himself. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. There's so many stories. If I had time, I could tell you of people that carried an idea to the nth degree with tragic results only to find out that Satan was influencing the whole thing all along. So how do you know 
whether or not this idea, this impression, this thought is in fact from God. What if there was a way to know? And I'm here to tell you that there is. If you look around, you've probably seen some cards sitting in the tables this morning. I'm going to ask you to get one in your hand. This is going to help me to preach faster. Boy, people started picking those cards up quick when I said that. Just get them in your hand. Uh, the, the, it's just a little simple tool uh, that I just hear from God, simple little tool that I developed a number of years ago. And I'll tell you, this is not just a sermon that I bring once in a while. This is a tool that I, I actually, my, mine is in my wallet. I carry it in my wallet all the time. And I pull it out every now and then just to remind myself when I've got any kind of a major decision, I want to make sure that I'm really hearing from God. So take a minute, uh, get that card in your hand. We're just going to walk through these seven right quick. Make sure we're on the same page. Make sure you understand what they're about. Then I'm going to send you out with this tool in your hand, particularly you graduates as you go into the next season of life, but quite frankly, for all of us as we make major decisions day by day by day. Now, let me say one thing before we get into it, okay? There are seven questions, seven filters, we'll call them, and if the idea or impression that you're carrying passes through all seven filters, then there's a very good chance that it's from God. There's always a faith factor when it comes to God. There's always a step out in faith when it comes to him. So I can't guarantee you, but I can guarantee you that if it does not pass all seven of these filters, it ain't from God. Let's practice saying that. It ain't from God. One more time. So if it passes five of the seven and you really like the idea... If it passes six of the seven, I guarantee you that if it doesn't pass all seven, it ain't from God. If it does, there's still a faith factor, but it may, in fact, be from God. So would this be helpful? I think it would. It has been for me. It has been for a lot of people. I've had so many hundreds, maybe thousands of people that have asked me as a pastor over the years, Pastor Jim, I got this idea. How do I know whether that's from God or not? Well, have you, ch- have you run it through the seven filters yet? Uh, no, I haven't. Well, let's run it through the seven filters and let's see. And as you walk through, it's an amazing tool that helps people that I believe God gave me many years ago and I've shared it everywhere I get a chance to share it. Okay, you ready to walk through them? Quickly as I can. Try not to keep it too long, but here we go. Number one, does it agree with the Bible? Does it agree with the Bible? I'll say it bluntly, say it directly. God will never contradict his written word with his spoken word to you. He would never say something in print and then turn around and say something else to you. So if it doesn't agree with Scripture, then it isn't God. It ain't from God, right? Uh, Luke uh, 21, 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In fact, the apostle Paul told the church at Galatia in chapter 1, verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. You know that's how most cults start? Is they get a, a word from an angel or they get a word from some other being and they say, well, this is an additional idea. This is an addition to the scriptures. Hear me, guys. It, even if an angel says it, if it ain't in the word of God, it ain't God. Let me just give you a couple quick examples and we'll move on. The Bible is clear. Sex outside of marriage is a sin and sin always leads to death, right? So if you get an idea... It can't be wrong when it feels so right. It ain't from God, right? That's what the scriptures say. The Bible says that we're to have integrity. We're to be honest people. So if you get an idea about how to make some money, and you may have to cut some corners, and you may have to tell a little white lie here and there, maybe cut back on your taxes, but you're going to make a lot of money at it. It ain't from God because nothing God has given you will contradict what he's already given you. The vast majority of God wants to say is already in God's word. God's will is found in God's word. And you know why that's so important that you learn the word of God? 
Why, so why we talk so much about getting into a bridge group and, and going through the growth track. You know why we do that? It's because when, uh, when you're about to make a decision, a lot of those decisions are rapid fire. They are boom, boom, boom. I got a decision to make. And if you have, have, have learned the word of God, if you studied the word of God, if you studied the scriptures, then the Holy Spirit has promised to bring to your remembrance those things that you learn so that you can test that idea against the scripture in the moment. But hear me, if you haven't membered the word, the Holy Spirit can't help you remember the word. Re is do it again. So you spend some time in scripture. You spend some time in a bridge group uh, discussing the word of God. Get into the growth track. Learn the word of God. Build that foundation for your life. I don't have that much time on all seven of these, but I want to make sure that one's clear. Okay, ready to move on number two? So does it line up with scripture? Number two, does it make me more like Christ? You know, these things aren't rocket science, but quite often, uh, quite often we just ignore them. We just miss them. We don't stop to think. So this is why this tool is so important. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him should do what? Should become like his son. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the Bible says. He is the standard by which everything else is measured. So if God's goal for your life is that you be like his son, Jesus, and you get an idea that does not move you closer to being like Jesus, then it ain't from God. It's really simple stuff, but let's, let's get practical, okay? I didn't give you the scripture in the notes, but here you go. James chapter 4, verse 14 says, If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is of the devil. In other words, if an idea that you're carrying around is born out of bitterness, you want to say it or you want me to? It, it ain't from God. If it comes out of envy, then it, it, it ain't from God. If it comes out of unforgiveness, it... It ain't, ain't from God. If it involves selfish ambition or manipulation of other people to get something that you want, that idea is not from God. On the other hand, the scripture goes on to say, the wisdom that comes from God is pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive and full of mercy and impartial and sincere. So if you have a pure thought, it might well be from God. If you have an impure one, it ain't from God. If it's peace-loving, if it promotes harmony and builds relationship, it may well be a word from the Lord. But if it destroys relationship, tears people down, it ain't from God. If it's considerate, always helpful for other people, then God's wisdom might be involved in this kind of thing. If it's being inconsiderate and rude, then it ain't from God. God, if it's sincere, you know, the, the, the English word sincere in Scripture in the original Greek is ano hupokritos. You recognize that word? Ano is a prefix that means the opposite of. Hupokritos is where we get the English word hypocrite. So sincere is the opposite of a hypocrite. So if you're being hypocritical, then that idea ain't from God. Because wisdom that comes from God is sincere. Is this tracking? Is this making sense? I'm trying, not, I'm trying to rush through this a little bit because I don't want to keep you, uh, you know, past the Baptist at the buffet. But, I, you know, but I do want you to get this. So when you get an idea and you start going, well, you know, I think this might be the Lord, then the first test is what? You got your card in front of you. Don't look at me. What, what's, what's the first test? Does it agree with the scriptures? What's the second test? will help me to become more like Jesus or pull me away from that. Number three, does my church family agree with it? Does it confirm it? Ephesians chapter three, verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. In other words, God speaks to the church and he speaks through the church. He speaks to his body from individuals within the, the body. So when you need wisdom, when you have an idea and you need to know whether or not that might be from God, where do you go? Who do you seek counsel from? Do you watch Okra Windy reruns? Do you read your horoscope? I mean, where do you go for advice and counsel? Or do you go to church? You have a conversation with the pastors or, or, or with your small group leader or with, with a trusted believer. How, where do you go? Hey, guys, I got this idea. What do you think? Could this be from God? I mean, frankly, any strong resistance to bounce an idea off of a fellow believer, who do you think gave you that resistance? 
It's Satan who doesn't want you to use this test against an idea. So anytime you say, I got an idea, but I could never tell anybody, I can never ask anybody what they think about it, then understand the odds are that idea ain't from God. On the positive side, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22, plans uh, go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. So if you get an idea and no other fellow Christians confirm that idea, it ain't from God. Now let me throw one more little detail. I'm going to take a minute and throw this detail in. One of the things that we all have to get good at maybe better at than we often are, is we need some Christians in our lives who love us enough to tell us the truth, even if it's a truth we don't want to hear. And we have to prepare our hearts to receive it. Quite often, it's easy to find rubber stamps. It's easy to find people say, oh, no, you're great. Oh, that's fine. Oh, no, no, that's fine. No, you should do that. Do you like that idea? Yeah, you should do that. We all need people in our lives that will tell us the truth. I tell the staff here at the church all the time. We had conversations in a meeting this week. I said, guys, here's my idea, but I am not emotionally invested in this idea. I'm emotionally invested in making the best decision we can make. So tear it apart. Pick it apart. Tell me what we ought to do differently. Tell me what you like and don't like. Why am I doing that? Because there's safety in multitude of advisors, and an idea from God will be confirmed by the body of Christ in one form and another. And if you can't get the body of Christ to confirm it, it ain't from God. Number four, is it consistent with how God made me? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Simple truth is, before we were born, Psalm 139 makes it clear, even while we were in our mama's womb, God saw us and he handmade us. People say about some folks sometimes, you know, man, they broke the mold when they made you. There's no mold. We're all handmade. We're all unique. And so God made us uniquely with purpose and meaning, regardless of the circumstances of your birth, regardless of the circumstances of your upbringing, God made you on purpose with a purpose. So, and then he gives you all the gifts and talents and abilities that you need in order to fulfill that purpose. Are you tracking with me? So if you get an idea that pulls you away from what it is that God made you to do, odds are it ain't from God, right? Because why would he make you to do something and then give you an idea to go in a completely different direction? In fact, we've got a whole semester in the growth track that just explores all of the spiritual gifts in Scripture. I've identified 31 spiritual gifts that are either directly or indirectly mentioned in Scripture. And we, we spend a whole semester just looking at gifts and figuring out what our gifts are. Why do we do that? Because it helps us to measure ideas whether or not they are from God. So put it simply, if you're gifted in music, uh, and you're, you're, you sing beautifully, then you may want to try out for the praise team. If you're tone deaf, we love you. We're not going to give you a microphone. I mean, it's just... Now, there is one exception to that, and that is next Sunday on the Father's Day Choir. <laughs> we want men and sons. My grandsons are coming from out of state to be in that choir. I mean, it's just going to be a really cool thing when a group of men and their sons and grandsons stand up here in the choir, and, and, and if you can't carry a tune, just move your mouth. But we want to send a message, not just to this congregation, but to the world, because these services go literally all over the world. They go to Asia and, 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 and Europe and Africa and all over the world. We want to send a message that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The men of this house are accepting their mantle of leadership in the in the home. So plan to be a part of that, guys. If you haven't signed up already, get registered. Let us know you're coming, and, uh, and we'll get you included in that, okay? Uh, as, but again, back to the topic at hand. If you get an impression, an idea that you ought to work with students, but you hate loud music, and you can't stand unbridled enthusiasm, chances are that idea ain't from God, right? That's just the reality of it. Here, here's, here's the myth. I've got to move on. But there's a myth that God's will is not fun, that's a lie. If God made you to do something, you usually enjoy doing it. 
because you see results from it. And so if God designed you from that and he gives you an idea to lean into that, then that's an indicator of your gifts. And that idea may in fact be from God when he pushes you into that. Romans chapter 12 verse 6, God has given each of us the ability to do certain things Well, he goes on to say, if your gift is teaching, then you ought to be teaching. And if your gift is administration, you ought to be administering. And if your gift is encouragement, then you ought to be encouraging. Why? Because you do, you serve according to your gifts. Simply put, God's voice will never contradict God's plan and purpose for your life. So if I get an impression this week that I should quit pastoring and go out for the MBA, it ain't from God because that's about as high as I can jump. That's all I got. Just... Anybody agree with me that, that if Satan can get you to do something that you're not gifted at, he just won? I mean, you could even be serving, but you're not serving in an area that God purposed for you. You're going to be frustrated. It's not going to work well. And the result is that he just one. Same thing on the other side. When you find that place where God called you to serve and he called you to be engaged and you start doing what God called you to do, it's a phenomenal kind of thing. You all perhaps know the Billy Graham story. Uh, made the most admired list in America. Uh, the whole 25 years they ran the list, usually number one in that kind of list. He, he had uh, the ear of every president for many decades uh, and the and, and story goes that one of those presidents invited Billy Graham to join his cabinet. As incredible an honor as that was, Billy Graham said, you know what, thank you very much. I'm honored that you ask, but God made me to be an evangelist, and I'm going to do what he made me to do. Billy understood something that we all need to understand. It may be good, that doesn't mean you should. Just because you can doesn't mean you ought to. Got it? Got it? But if you get an idea and it's consistent with how God made you, it may in fact be from God. Number five, this is a biggie. Do I have authority in this area? You get an idea before you move forward and say, I've heard from God, then you got to stop and ask yourself the question, do I have authority in this area? In other words, is it any of my business? John, uh, John chapter 21 tells a story uh, of, of Jesus having one of that closing conversation with Peter after the resurrection, and he's, get, he's commissioning Peter and, in fact, challenging him about the reality of, do you really love me, Peter? And ultimately, Jesus says to Peter, you know what, you're, you're going to die by crucifixion. You know what Peter's response was? Some of you know that story. He said, well, okay, well, uh, how about John? How he's gonna, how's he going to die? And you know what Jesus said? He said, it ain't none of your business how he's going to die. He's got his uh, story and you got your story. He's got his journey with me. You got your journey with me. So when you get an idea about somebody else's journey, be careful. You get some, an idea about somebody else if somebody else needs to know something you've heard from God on their behalf, be careful. Am I saying that we never hear from other members of the body of Christ? Of course not. Of course not. God speaks in all kinds of prophetic ways and amazing kinds of ways. But here's my advice to you, and it comes out of my own experience, my understanding of Scripture, is that there is a fine line between confirmation and manipulation. So when somebody comes to me, and I've had it happen many times over the years, perhaps you have too, somebody comes to me and says, you know, I believe I have a word from the Lord for you, I may be interested to hear what they've got to say. But if somebody comes to me, gets in my face and says, thus saith the Lord, I really stop listening after that point. Because you see, I talked to him this morning, and he would have mentioned it to me. I had a fellow, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a fellow uh, about five years ago now, a little over five years ago now. He was a friend. Uh, he's from St. Louis, Missouri. We had left Chesapeake, Virginia, had turned the church that we led over to a young man that I trained and released it to him. And, and, uh, and we moved to Goldsboro to lead the Acts 2 network and kind of semi-retire. And, and you know, we just, uh, that friend uh, called me one day from St. Louis. And he said, Jim, I was praying this morning and I got a thought. I'm just going to put it out there. You can judge whether it's from the Lord or not, um, but I'm just going to put it out there. And uh, and I said, okay, what is it, Mike? He said, well, you know, we've been assuming that, that this whole journey of getting Michael set at Community Church and you stepping back for him to lead it to the next place and you moving back to Goldsboro, that that's all about leading the Acts 2 network. And he said, but it could, could it be that God's brought you to Goldsboro for a local church that needs you? 
What Mike had no idea of is that five days earlier, Pastor Farrell had called me and said, Jim, the Lord, I'm done. The Lord's released me. It's time for me to go. And I talked him out of it but for a minute, but God told him. Mike had no idea. So was that a word from the Lord? I think it stands a really good chance of being a word from the Lord because here I am five years later, right? But he didn't say, Jim, this is what you have to do. Thus saith the Lord, here's what God's telling you. God told me to tell you. He just said, I'm going to put this out there and let you judge it from the Lord. Another guy came to me one time after speaking, and he said, God told me to tell you you're supposed to be a televangelist. No, I don't think so. I mean, we're preparing to go to the Philippines as missionaries right now. That's, they don't have televangelists in the Philippines. I think you might be mistaken. And so all I'm saying is, I'm not saying don't speak a word to people. Just be careful how you do it. It can be manipulation and you don't even mean it to. So you get an idea for somebody else's journey. Make sure that you are, your motives are pure for sharing that idea. Make sure that you're sharing it in a way that you trust that they can hear from God too. You ready? Moving on. Number, number one, what's the first test? Does it match the Bible? Agree with the Bible. Number two is, make me more like Christ. Well, number three, well, can I get my church family to, to confirm it and agree with it? Number four, is it consistent with how God made me? Number five, is, do I actually have authority in that area? Is it appropriate for me to step into that area? Number six is a big one. And that is, is it convicting rather than condemning? This is huge for an awful lot of people because I meet a lot of Christians who walk around with what I call condemnation thinking. Hello? They walk around with this idea, I'm no good, I'm a worm, God could never use me, oh, I could never do that, oh, God, I think God's calling me to do this or that, but who's, who am I to do that? <coughs> I could never do that. <coughs> and they kind of live under this cloud of condemnation, and I need you to understand that you have an, if you have an idea and it's condemning in nature, it ain't from God. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now understand something because there's a very, very clear distinction that you need to understand. John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8. Let's read it together. One, two, three, go. Unless I go away, Jesus said, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will, what? He will condemn the world. It's not what it says. He will what? He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin. Now, some people read that verse and immediately go, oh, Holy Spirit's here to convict me. I'm guilty. Uh." Let me tell you what an incredible blessing that is. When our boys were growing up and they especially got into their teen years and, and, uh, and I was talking to one of my sons one day and, and, and I, I, I said something to him about what I sensed in my spirit and he hung his head. I, he was about to make a huge mistake. He wanted to do it, but it would have been a mistake. And I said, son, do you know how blessed you are that your mom and dad are filled with the Holy Spirit and he speaks to us on your behalf sometimes and we're able to head that off for you? He said, yeah, I'm blessed. (laughs) Later, as an adult, he said, man, was I blessed. Hear me, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is a blessing because it will keep you from going down a road that you don't want to go down because sin always costs more than you wanted it to cost. And so conviction is very different from condemnation. What's the end result of conviction? God points out to you something that you're doing wrong or something you're failing to do. You repent, he forgives, you learn from the experience and you grow, right? What's the result of condemnation? Satan accuses, you feel worthless, you feel like a failure, you feel like you're a mess up again, you feel defeated and unworthy, you're ready to quit. Are they different? They are profoundly different. So let me just say it bluntly. You can judge whether this is a word from the Lord for you in this moment or not, but if you still feel guilty for something that you have brought to the foot of Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive you for, and you've repented and broken free from that, it ain't from God. Let it go. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's so vital because otherwise Satan can get you thinking in this condemnation kind of thinking. So conviction is from who? 
God. Condemnation is from who? Satan, the enemy of your soul. Conviction says you've sinned, you were unkind to your wife, you you cut that guy off in traffic, you you lied to avoid that situation. It's specific. You know exactly what you did, and then you can do something about it. Condemnation is vague, it's general, you're worthless, you've done so much God could never forgive you. Conviction is recognizable and fixable. Condemnation is imaginary and brings you down. Bottom line, God never attacks your self-worth. He loves you this much. So much that he sent his son to die in your place. That's how valuable you are. So when you feel bad, worthless, get an idea that you're never going to get over this, you want to say it or you want me to? It ain't from Number seven, we'll wrap. Do I sense God's peace about it? Do I sense God's peace about it? It's interesting because that's the one that, an, that a huge percentage of Christians that I talk to, that's the only one they use. Well, it just feels right. It just feels good. You know, I'm, I'm at peace about this. I think this might be the right thing because I'm at peace. And so, hear me, am I telling you not to consider that? Of course not. It is one of the seven. But did I mention somewhere along the way that if it doesn't pass all seven, it ain't from God? So include it by all means, but let it be one of the list. 1 Corinthians 14, God is not the author of confusion. Teenagers are. I'm, no, I mean, <laughs> just wanted to see if you're awake. Sorry, teenagers. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So bottom line, I'll move on. If you feel pressured to make a decision in a hurry, chances are it ain't from God. Because the Holy Spirit draws gently. Satan presses and pressurizes. If you miss out on something, maybe the best thing that ever happened. I've so many times over the years that a high-pressure salesman will turn the pressure on, try to get me to say yes, and I just shut down. I, you know, and I've looked at salesmen before and said, you know, this may be the best thing since sliced bread, but your pressurized approach has caused me to say no, even if I'm going to miss out on something. Because my God draws me gently and gives me time to process. Satan pushes and pressurizes him. Any parents here? Any parents here? Do you want your children pressurized? Do you want them stressed to the max? Do you want them anxious? Or do you want them making wise decisions gently and at peace? Well, that's what our Heavenly Father is like as well. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When God speaks and you follow, it brings a calm, even if it seems impossible, because you know that God is at work. I got to close. Is this a tool that might be helpful? I would encourage you. I would challenge you. I would beg you, whatever word you want to use, to keep this handy. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it in your wallet. And anytime you make any kind of major decision, whip it out. Walk through the list. Make sure you check it against the Word of God. Make sure that you've got fellow Christians who love you enough to tell you the truth, who will speak into it. Make sure that you're walking through these processes. But I would encourage you to become so familiar with it that it just becomes a part of everyday decision. It is for me. I've been doing it so many years now that I just do a quick run through the seven filters in my mind before I make any significant decisions. Not necessarily what I'm going to eat for lunch today, but uh, I'll take a risk on that one. But anything that could be life-altering or changing the lives of the people I'm in relationship with. I believe that if it passes all seven, there's still a faith factor, but you may very well have heard from God. Let's pray. As we close, I realize some of you might be thinking, I, I, I never hear from God. I, I don't really get any ideas or impressions that I think are from God. Um, I'm just not sure. Well, then maybe John 8, 47 is your verse. Hear it with all the love that I can communicate with my voice. Jesus said, he who belongs to God hears what God says. 
The reason you don't hear is that you don't belong to Him. So maybe if you're not hearing from God, the place to start, not here to be judge, jury, or anything like that, just simply throwing out a suggestion. Maybe if you never hear from God, the place to start is to say, Lord, I'm yours. I want what you want. I want to hear your voice. And when you speak, I will respond. I mean, why would God tell you what to do if he knows you're not going to do it anyway? Maybe that's the beginning place. In fact, I'm going to ask us all to pray that prayer before we go. Prayer simply says, Lord, I want to hear from you. My answer in advance is I want what you want. I want to do what you've designed for me to do. I want your will, not mine. Some of you are praying already. Some of you are waiting for me to give you some words. That's fine, but let's pray that prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Give me a fresh start right now, and let that fresh start be defined by your will for my life. I want to hear your voice. And when I hear it, you'll know in advance that I will test it. And when I believe it's you, I will obey. In Jesus' name, Father, you know who's praying, you know the struggles, you know the celebrations, you know us all, you know what's going on. And I just pray in the quietness of this moment you'd speak to us, that you'd speak your love to us, give us all a fresh start today, hearing from you and responding to you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. This coming Saturday morning, I'm, I'm sure you've heard something about it. You've seen it on screens and gotten emails and social media posts and whatever else. But I want to take just a second before I let you go and let you hear my heart. Prayer is not a speech that you prepare and send to God. Prayer is a dialogue. Prayer is an exchange with the God of the universe. The problem is we often don't know how to listen this coming Saturday morning at the prayer summit, that's exactly what I and some of our other team are going to teach you how to do. We're going to teach you a process that will position you not only to speak to God, but to hear from Him. And in the process of hearing from Him, I believe with everything in me that you will come to the deepest place of intimacy with Him you've ever been. I don't say that lightly. You've probably never heard me say words like that before. I'll tell you one quick story, and I'm going to Ask Pastor Andy to come in and dismiss our service, but I want to encourage you to come. What we're going to be teaching on Saturday, I taught to a group of 100 pastors in El Salvador just a few years ago. There was one pastor sitting right in front of me who was in a bright red vestments and a big silver cross. He was a bishop in one of the liturgical churches there in San Salvador. Throughout the whole teaching, through the whole process, he sat very stiffly and sternly. His wife was fully engaged. I'm thinking the whole time he doesn't like anything I'm saying. He doesn't want to do anything I'm recommending. The end of the time we had a time of worship and then a time in the altars to pray. And that man in his vestments came directly to me, got right in my face and in his broken English, he said, I realize today that I've become a professional minister, but I left my first love, and he broke. And he wound up on his hands and knees in the altar, and I got down with him, and we prayed through to give him a fresh anointing for the ministry to which God had called him. I believe with everything in me, if you'll set aside some time this Saturday and engage fully in the process, you will find yourself in a fresh place with him. Let us know you're coming so we can be prepared. We look forward to seeing you at the prayer summit. God bless you guys. Pastor Andy's coming.